Now, Denji, uh, Comrade Denji, we have spoken much. Um, my statement that I needed to present today is already on the ministry's website. I understand that it has also been circulated to a number of delegates. So I will not be um, taking much of the time through my presentation, but I will highlight um, what I consider to be very useful in um, using that presentation um, so that when you discuss various topical and difficult issues, you would at least have regard to what we have set ourselves up to as far as the Constitution is concerned. But having been here for about five hours, I realized that I had to uh, read through the way I wanted to present this and start briefly with just few statements just to win confidence that although I'm usually associated to the party in a way that to what I do every day I represent people and I do not care much about the opponent's rights and interests. I'm just presenting an honest, neutral and uh, a presentation made without, without prejudice or bias against anybody. Mm. Um, I'm also in a very good position because I benefit from the fact that I have lived through a difficult period as a child of this country. My own father used to be dragged out of his bedroom and I always thought it was one of the normal things of our time. I didn't have the ability to think that what was causing that to is the absence of constitutionalism in our country at that time and that anarchy prevailed. Uh, I also, apart from the fact that I managed to benefit from good programs of this government to go through varsity after independence and have a reasonable life, challenges in this society such as land, although I have a house, I have a small farm, not the resettlement farm, <laughs> my house at Tonyanyo. At five this evening when people close their offices, six of my siblings are going to other people's houses to listen. Notwithstanding my efforts to pick them up, it has been a very difficult situation. So I'm not speaking here as if I am uh, divorced from what is going on. Yeah, but let me start with my presentation. Um, now, the, in my presentation, those who will get an opportunity to read, I decided upfront to recognize the untold suffering, the injustice suffered by Namibia, all the Indian schools. But the massive injustice, particularly in relation to land dispossession suffered by Herreros, because it was also accompanied by genocide in Amar and Tamar, were too bad, were so degraded <coughs> to the extent that we can never forget them. <laughs> The cry and calls for reform by disabled, all of us, are understandable. Are understandable because people suffered and that is the reason that in the early 60s, the founding fathers, Dr. Hager, Dr. Pohamba, Dr. Chabili, Dr. Uh, Kurira, Adenahas, J. 
People drawn from different types of this calibers and lighter forms decided to take a common step to go and fight. After finding, fighting at independence, then we decided what is our constitutional vision for this country? Looking at the background. And the vision that our founding fathers that set to craft a constitution for us is abandoned from our constitutional preamble. Because you can see from the preamble that the need justice, the fact that there was no constitutional oversight, people would disappear, people would be hanged, kids would be left without fathers and mothers. Our founding fathers wanted to break, notwithstanding untold injustice. They decided we must, for ourselves, set a dispensation, which, if we were to leave this country through there, our kids and our grandchildren we will have left with them a very good constitutional democracy so that what we were subjected to when bad leaders comes amongst us who may come to call for death penalty to them there is a constitutional order that will bind us together and will be used as a bar for us not to return to the brutal and shameful past. So now, with that constitutional and historical background, let me then start with the presentation that I think will assist you. Because in certain respect, the constitutional provisions I will be speaking about shortly will be presenting you with an opportunity to make very good reform. But unfortunately, and we should not fear about this, some of them will prove to be legal and constitutional impediment to whatever we want. We must also be careful because those who advance views, putting in doubt, putting in dispute, our unitary statehood relies on articles such as that, Article 23 that obligate parliament to make law to pick up people that were in the past subjected to untold suffering. So they rely on one part of the constitution, but yet they undermine another one. Those who do not want ancestral right claimed, they say it will, Namibia is a unitary state, so they rely on unitary state, but then they also take away other people's right. For me, what I want to do is to make a presentation so that we honestly, if there are things we cannot do as far as the Constitution is concerned, those things cannot be done because that is what we set ourselves to. If there are things we can do in terms of the Constitution or in terms of legislation, then we can do. Now, one thing we, we don't remember is this. The Parliament, National Assembly in particular, those who have uh, your constitution, people say, when you want to change Article Chapter 3, we probably just have to change it. But that is a small problem. There are bigger problems because you will find that, in fact, the National Assembly is under obligations under Article 63, sub-Article 2, that the National Assembly shall further have the power and function subject to this constitution. Already at that starting point, the Founding Father, when they said, that when they discussed through consensus, they 
whatever role or role, even before you start standing up in the National Assembly, there is a constitutional bar not to make obligation to make law subject to the Constitution. First one. Simple as that. Yet, our Supreme Court, Supreme Court, in a very difficult case, in a very difficult case, just like then, that also was very emotive. Labor high. Labor high. Our Constitution, our Supreme Court, the, despite the public pressure, in the judgment in 2009, stated, and I quote shortly, the purpose of the freedom in Article. Can I then start with the topical issue of amending the Constitution? Yeah. In particular, Article uh, Chapter 3. First of all, it's not correct that Chapter 3 cannot be amended. It can be amended, but only if you strengthen and enhance the right. So when, so first of all, the provisions is not, it's not correct to really to say chapter 3 can never be amended. What is prohibited, what is prescribed is to amend with the purpose of diminishing the right, including impact, <laughs> including impact, including life. Now, people speak about Article 131. 131. There must have been something that our founding fathers thought. They wanted to send them something. And they choose different areas of rights, ranging from right to speak, ranging from to right to repeat. But all these rights, by the way, are subjected to some limitations. They are not open ended. But Article 131, and here I am speaking with no degree of doubt, uh, simply the, the purpose of that article is to entrench. Is like a law because it's telling that no repeal or amendment of any provisions of chapter 3 hereof, insofar as such repeal or amendment, repeal means to abolish, amendment means only to. Yeah. So, both a repeal or an amendment are prohibited if such seek to diminish rights in them. Now, then you go to Article 132. It's about amendment or repeal of the Constitution. So in other words, our Constitution could be repealed or could be amended. And it speaks about how you amend the Constitution. Two-thirds in the National Assembly, two-thirds in the National Council, and then it tells you if the National Assembly get two-thirds, the National Council does not get two-thirds, the President, by proclamation, if he deems necessary, can order a referendum. But the referendum, by the way, can only be made if there is a law dealing with the referendum. Exactly. It's, it's incorporated now in the, in the new... Uh, yes. So now, but... Article 132.5 says nothing contained in this article, otherwise in Article 132, shall detract in any way from the entrenchment provided for in Article 131 here of the fundamental right and freedom contained and defined in that chapter 3. In other words, under Article 132, you are again being reminded that the power we give you to repeal and amend the Constitution 
up uh, in through national or the parliamentary referendum. Those powers do not include the power to detract from the infringement. Back to square one. So you can, if you, one can debate and debate and debate, and one can cut pieces from the Constitution through amendment, chapter three, you can only add substantively on the right in place there. But let me make it easy. It's not that there are problems. The, if the problem is Article 16, Comrade President, and sub Article 1 and 2, I don't think there is such a huge problem. There will be challenges that we cannot navigate through this problem, through those uh, provisions by making proper legislation that assists our people. Because one remember, from the President, that Article 16, one in particular, it gives people, and this is important because it's a misunderstood with respect. Uh, first of all, Article 16, one, it first gives people right in any part of Namibia to acquire, that is one, another way to get to acquire, to own, after acquiring, to own, and dispose, another way to, to sell or donate, of all forms of property, including immovable property. So in other words, we have fundamental right to own immovable property among which is this bad. And movable property individual in an association and to be back with them. But there is a provision. Provided that parliament may by legislation prohibit my my way to uh, delegates and uh, fellow Namibian um, by by legislation, parliament may prohibit or regulate as it deems expedient their right to acquire. Now, initially, it speaks about the right to, um, to acquire, own, and dispose. Now, it says, Parliament may, through legislation, prohibit or regulate the right to acquire. It left out own and dispose. The right to acquire by of a property by person who are not Namibian. So, in other words, the legislation then, the Constitution then say. You have the right whether you are an Namibian or not a Namibian. However, parliament can regulate how a foreign can acquire property in Namibia. That, is, that also includes that. Then to give you an example, then what happens when we come up with the, with the Agricultural Commercial Reform Act, which deals with the resettlement? Then it then instead of regulating only the right of some, it also regulated the right of Namibian and in particular also formerly disadvantaged as far as selling is concerned. In other words, it says if you are selling your farm, even if you are a black selling to another black, both of you are formerly disadvantaged. You must first offer to the state. Even if there is a former disadvantage, who does not have the farm, who does not have the land, you are obligated when you dispose to first offer to the state. Instead, the head of regulating foreigners when they acquire or when they dispose, or even those who only were advantaged during your yeah, yeah. time. Then the next article is Article then 62 about Congress uh, expropriation. But let me be frank, be frank about this. I think we have, although it's not the excellent piece of legislation we have, but we have the ordinance expropriation of 1973 is still on our statute book. That is a general one on expropriation. Then you have the Land Reform Act, which 
in relation to expropriation of formation of fact. Now, obviously, obviously, the consideration the minister must look at when negotiate prices and when deciding to expropriate are not that good. They must be looked at. Because, um, uh, to give you an example, in South Africa, when they expropriate, the relevant com uh, competent minister responsible for that is one of the considerations when you negotiate, uh, when you pay compensation, you look at the price of acquisition, uh, the history of acquisition. History of acquisition so that if you have two formal advantage people that you want to expropriate their farm, one is a white, good advocate who represented plane fighters, worked hard, made money, never supported apartheid, bought his farm from the open market. Then you have a Kufut guy <laughs> who was rewarded for participating in Kasinga massacre. Oh, then that should be a consideration in terms of price. Because you are then given power to look at the history of acquisition. When you grapple with the question of what is just to the owner of the property and the society. So, but you can make reform in the context of legislation, tighten them up, bring in more, which is good for your people. Let's talk about, in 2007, government did well, tried to expropriate the absentee, you know, you know, that's far. I think it was three farms. We are trying to take huge decision and possibly in a larger scale, and we will fall into problems if we are not careful, because if we don't pause address other associated problems such as human capacity resources and so on. Even if you have good law, because I have the judgment of those cases, I have the judgment. <laughs> In fact, compensation, a just compensation was never dealt with by the, by the High Court. The cases only failed at the question of whether or not government must expropriate those farms because even notices, just notices to send notices, we didn't get them correct. Yes. Just to send notices. Mm -hmm. After the high court, the high court took a uh, catalog of way how to do it, the government, obviously. So sometimes we want to make pronounced announcement that may really prove difficult for us to manage, but sometimes it's because we don't look at what we have and see whether we could do it with such. And I believe that um, while it's not possibly the proper thing, article is not the best we would have wanted to have, some way we could have, uh, we could manage. I'm, I'm moving on with speed. Now, let me then deal with the, in South Africa, for example, of uh, individuals in my paper, I have recognized that I not decided not to be dismissive or not to be too for anything. Just try to analyze the laws and see what we have. You find that in South Africa, under Section 25 of their constitution, they have a provision in their constitution constitutionally ordained indigenous land claim. They are there in the constitution. And they say those who were dispossessed of their land through a colonial discriminatory policies, only from 1915, for good or for bad, they decided if you lost before that, you can claim. But the South African land claim, and I refer to only one, Example, uh, Comrade President, 
found it difficult in one case. And it's a major problem when they are implementing it. And it commented in a judgment, uh, in a judgment of a community that wants to claim restitution. First of all, I must explain that when we talk about indigenous men claim, when we end the indigenous uh, ancestral men claim, when you we start ending restitution, we are talking about a claim. Like if you have if you are defamed defamation. And there is always a question, what is the remit? What do you want? You want to be paid compensation, what do you want? Restitution is restitution of lost land. So in other words, you are going to be put in a position you were before the dispossession. So we must be very careful. When you just use terms and say um, uh, indigenous men playing the restitution that what do you want? Then you, you, one says, is that geographically, whatever I had, I want restitution of that lost land. Now, in South Africa, uh, where the right is, is in the Constitution, the land claim court in one judgment then say, and the, the reality that restoration of land within the towns would well require, as envisaged by the ninth respondent, Towns people to be expropriated of their houses. The expropriation of schools, churches, parks, and other facilities, as schools, okay, also in respect of numerous businesses, industries, and other economic activities, and so forth. Now, the point was they found themselves in a situation where we put this right in the Constitution and give people right when one of the limits is restitution. But because of the changing world, uh, we introduce towns and so on. And we say it's a unitary state, not like Nigeria, federal state. Move freely, we invited everybody. Now, what do we do with that? So, but one must look at other things. Can it be addressed through alternative equitable redress? For instance, in our law, not in a direct discriminatory way, because all people of Namibia have the right to stay wherever they want as for the president state. Because it is in the constitution. But I think one can obviously, because we do it with um, marginalized people in some of our policies, to factor in like a tender one or two percentage. If you have two individuals, <laughs> This one is saying, my grandma lives in this area or so forth. The other one, you have two applicants, there are two farms available. You see whether, I'm not saying, I mean, these are things to be debated and interrogated. Maybe you factor in some, re, uh, some redress in your policies, but not to throw away the Constitution. Never. Because this country is still. I think those who have suffered for many years, and some people still have scars, they can never live a day without a constitution in this country. Because then we start with revenge. Then we cannot speak to, to kids in the street when we say they are making pronouncements that are unconstitutional. We want to change them from school because they are advocating for things that will destroy our peace. But nobody has the exclusive domain to encourage things that are not constitutional. We must all who are in need, celebrated, the malign, we all have the same right. So it is dangerous from a point of view of an independent legal practitioner who practices in the Supreme Court and in the High Court. I'm at the same level with the member of an executive, legislator, and judicial, all of whom have taken an oath to respect the Namibian constitution. Mm. Yeah. So, then, in conclusion, I have skipped a lot of articles because time is not on our side. Comrade A.G. spoke about Article 100. 
of the Namibian Constitution. It says that independent natural resources, water, and land, government and state have sovereign ownership unless if such land is otherwise lawfully owned. Obviously, now you have land all over, including communal areas now. When you fit in a question of what is it, indigenous? I, I, yes. It becomes a problem. It's a claim against the state, for instance, in rural area. What, what is the claim about? I'm not dismissing it, an idea. I'm discussing it so that we think and interrogate to assist us in our deliberation. What are we trying to say? There are huge problems. Of course, they need to be reformed because I checked our act, uh, section three of the local authorities act. Give the minister responsible power to declare towns even in communal area. Yes, it does not speak of compensation. One can go and look at it. Does not. That's why we have problems all over. But then, in the communal land reform act section fifteen forty, yes, uh, it communal. Land is established and recognized by the president in terms of section 15 and section 40 prohibit compensation, by the way. There is even a heading says prohibition to compensation. But there is an exception which says only you can only be compensated if you reach an agreement, if you are transferring your popular right and you have built improvement or whatever. So very discriminatory, is very bad. But then in the local authorities act, there is nothing. Then it is. Then the communal land reform act says if the president withdraw land from communal area, those who are there may be compensated for this legal compensation. But yet the local authorities is silent. So all these laws need to be looked at properly so that tangible reform for the benefit of our people are made. Because if we are not careful, people will think the problem is the constitution. Of course, the federal constitution may be a problem here, and there. but in most cases, it is within our policies, within our laws, that are not properly considered. And therefore, in conclusion, I'm moving fast because um, um, the Comrade President, I think, I think. I need to, to say this. In one of the cases in the Supreme Court, we were reminded, and this captures really why the things are not, and we must understand everybody who is crying now because people suffer, substantively suffer, and the effect are felt by everybody. The, the Supreme Court but in trying to remind us what happened to us and how we adapted independent, stated in the judgment and said, self-evident as this right may now seem to sovereign nation who by revolution or political evolution attained democratic self-governance long ago, it has been denied the people of Namibia by successive colonial and foreign regimes for more than a century in recent history. It was ultimately won only two decades ago, after a, pra a protracted struggle for liberation and independence. The cost of victim measured in human lives, endurance, in their cannot be calculated. Determine that the right which they have gained as individual and as people should be preserved and protected for themselves. It's an Namibian discovery is open. And their children. Namibian resolve that it would be done most effectively in a democratic society. <coughs> The Constitution is against anarchy in the preamble. It speaks about reconciliation, 
When you say one nation, one man, maybe a, there is a substantive point in it. Which you say, how do we reject people that killed people in Katima in 1990 or 1999? We rejected them. Not only within the law, not only through using the Namibian Defense Force that is constitutionally empowered to defend our territorial integrity. But we re also rejected them by telling them that Namibia is a unitary state. So we can't, because next time somebody will want the constitution to be amended so that we, we remove the constitutional format of the state as a unitary state. A bad leader masquerading amongst us in 20 years from now, a bad one like the Idi Amin, will want to say, because I have no control on the media, I have no control on this citizen, I want to remove freedom of speech. <laughs> we can never go back. So with that presentation, my, uh, just like the one of the, the group of Hamba, is also a available for distribution. I <laughs> so, uh, so uh, I, I hope I was not speaking as a higher class. I was not speaking as somebody who lives elsewhere. I was speaking as a child of Namibia. I was speaking as somebody who lived through all this and somebody who is very proud of what we have chosen as a country and somebody who have benefited from the legacy and I know my kids will live better than I did when I was a child if we play within the constitutional qualifiers. Honorable President, um, that is a need I needed to say.